to take okay, thank you. Yes, I'll just uh, uh, talk. I think there are three important points Randy has made in his very useful uh, comments. Uh, the first is that uh, about construction. The thing I would want to emphasize, I don't think the best, the, I think the best arguments for why a judicial duty is part of the Constitution and why a requirement of judicial clarity, as it were, is part of it is is to understand it as part of judicial power or understand it in, in Stephen Sachs' terms as a judicial backdrop rather than a method. So that is, I think I'm clear in the paper on that, but if not, that, that is, uh, that's, I think, the better understanding is not as an original uh, method, although I'm not, of course, disavowing those right here and now. Uh, the second point is uh, uh, I agree that this paper is about meaning rather than uh, deference to facts. I still think that is a lot of importance. Uh, uh, I think that's what's at issue in the debate about the meaning of the Second Amendment. It's a debate about whether commer commercial uh, commerce clause covers inactivity. I think there's a question about what the meaning of the commerce clause is. I, I, the one reason I'm a little reluctant to actually get involved uh, in the question of facts here is because I actually don't think that was the way people really conceived of judicial review. I think it's really the rational basis tests are actually more uh, uh, post-New uh, Deal. And so one reason that's why I, I don't know what I think about that, and I'd like to, to, to reserve judgment on it. But in some sense, that's, that's the reason is because I'm trying actually to be more truthful to, I think, what they thought the crucial issues were. Uh, and I, I think, at least in the way I use the quotes here, I think they all are about meaning. The Marsh, uh, in the McCulloch, for instance, it's about how Marshall goes about trying to figure out what necessary means in necessary and proper. And the third point, I, I don't think I, I have a great disagreement with Randy in it. In some ways, the reason I use judicial restraint here is that's the modern debate, and I'm trying to actually, by taking that term, to turn it around and show it's really about judicial duty and a judicial, which includes a judicial duty of clarification. And so precisely so that's, that Justice Scalia and other people don't start going off about the judicial role rather than focus on the judicial requirement of looking at every consideration, as I Riddell suggests. And the reason I use judicial restraint is just that's the term uh, in the, that's used today. I'd like to translate it back into this rather narrow requirement that you have to uh, f be, have a clear and stable understanding of the Constitution before striking something down. That that is, that's all that judicial restraint can mean. I precisely don't want to buy in to these other ideas, which I think are very close to Thayer's ideas. Thayer, I think, is in some sense the beginning of that progressive idea of judicial restraint. And I emphatically reject Thayer. So at this point, we have uh, three groups of three questions. So the first uh, group is uh, consists of Jim Allen, Will Bode, and myself. Jim. John, some water. Can you get some water, please? I had two quibbles about the paper, and then a really great question. So the first quibble is, when you're talking about the pre-constitution stuff at one point, John, you point to the UK, I'm Canadian. Um, and you imply that there are instances, you don't actually explicitly say it in the paper, but you imply that there are instances of British judges striking down statutes on the basis of the common law. Absolutely, I, well, I just don't think that's right. I know everyone points to Cook and Dr. Bonham's case, but that's an outlier. He's a loose agent. I think Jeff Goldsworthy's dealt with that. It just didn't happen. The, he didn't strike down statutes, but, you know, I'm happy to be showing I'm wrong, but I don't think that's right. The other quibble is in the in the course, at, at the end, you say uh, one response to <coughs> someone like me, you, saying that uh, you know judges had no sense that they were actually uh, making law, and the evidence looks pretty good, um, is that someone might say, well, this is, this is a truth claim. Whether judges have discretion is a truth claim. It doesn't matter what they thought. And in the course of that, at the very end of the paper, you say, uh, you know, H.L.A. Hart, whom I really like, argues that there are substantial gap gaps in the written law. But really, that's not my reading of Hart. He never says that there are substantial gaps. He says there's tiny little gaps. And in the course of, look at all the things that a law, legal system can do to create certainty, he's basically right there with the rule of formalists, I think, a tiny little bit in saying there's sometimes gaps. So I don't think you can say that Hart thought there are substantial gaps. But again, another quibble. But my, my, my question is just a clarifying one. A bunch of times in the paper you go, constitutional rev review is, 
fundamentally illegal rather than political enterprise. Okay, so I come from Canada where the judges make things up all the time. That's all they do. Um, and, you know, that, there's elements of that in the courts here. Are you really saying that constitutional review should be illegal rather than a political enterprise? Are you saying it doesn't matter what interpretive theory they use, constitutional review is a fundamentally legal question? Because, I mean, I'm reading you as saying should be, but maybe I'm wrong. I think what I'm saying there is... Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Yeah. Yeah, let me try to write these. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, 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 Will, you're next. So, so my question is, uh, no rules, uh, but why not extend the same logic to precedent? So on its face, it seems like a similar problem. When should a judge accept somebody else's view of what the Constitution means? Sometimes it's somebody else is the legislature that passed the statute. Sometimes it's somebody else is the court that had a prior decision. You can imagine, I would have expected you to say the same thing, you know, when you have to be clear, have a clear and stable understanding to a overall precedent, but you can use all available methods to try and develop a clear and stable understanding. You shouldn't be overly deferential. And Caleb Nelson suggested that was the original conception of stare decisis and precedent. And I know you don't extend it to precedent, and you say it's different. Precedent is a common law doctrine that you do through purely consequentialist uh, reasons. But I wonder why, and it, you know, if you're right that precedent should be done that way, then why is judicial restraint done that way too? It seems odd methodologically that one is, one is a backdrop and the other is a common law uh, normative thing that changes. Okay, uh, my question is uh, along the similar lines to Jim's, I guess, in, in one respect. Uh, that is uh, this distinction between whether judges are just finding the law, discovering it, or making it. Uh, does a lot of work in the paper, it runs through the whole paper, and it's part of, I think, how you... Uh, Help to explain the error um, of Thayer. You know, the, the the founding period people thought that uh, judges just found the law, but by Thayer's time they thought that judges were making the law and so forth, were legislating. And the distinction seems a little. Uh, it troubled me because it seemed a little clean, and I was wondering you know, was something like judgment. You know, how how this would fit in. So one place where this came up was towards the end of the paper when you're talking about contemporary implications, and you say that. Um, there's uh, Carl Llewellyn's famous list of supposedly conflicting canons of interpretation. Um, but then, I, I'm not sure I was clear, but I think you say, but th that's not really a conflict so much as those are just all part of evidence about what the law is. Uh, it seemed like a little bit of an odd way to characterize that. And I wondered whether that's one point at which you might say, um, at the founding and at Thayer's time and later, it was probably true, and people probably understood that there was something like judgment that went into uh, into interpreting the Constitution that wasn't just finding it in a simple evidentiary type of thing, and it wasn't just making law either or or legislating. It was something something in between. And Hamilton talks about his judgment, not will. That's not quite. This. And um, and if that's true, wouldn't that leave room for something more like a Thayer? position than you, than you allow, um, and, and also, you know, what would the contemporary implications of that be? So, so there are three questions. So. Okay, well, to the first question, what I was trying to say is that judges uh, that at the time the historical materials didn't, uh, and their understanding of judicial review was as a legal act, applying one law over another. It was not as a political act as I think Thayer uh, understands it to be, and so it was, uh, as or as Hamilton suggests, it was very analogous to trying to figure out which statutes applied. So that's really what I'm, all I'm saying. Now I'm making really more a historical claim uh, in this paper rather than some normative claim. Although insofar as I'm an originalist, maybe I also am making implicitly a normative claim. To the question of precedent, well. Um, I guess maybe what I would say is that I'm a little less certain about what the rules of precedent are. The, 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 I think the um, evidence in this paper really is not about precedent, and maybe Caleb is right about that. I'm not quite so sure. One reason is it seems to me that, uh, there, that precedent wasn't as stable a doctrine. In other words, you couldn't actually say that there was a very... As, now I think it's hard to say there was a very clear understanding, a very clear and mechanical, even clear standard of precedent at the time. And therefore, I think there is a, a, a requirement, uh, there is only a requirement maybe as part of judicial 
a power as a legal obligation to take into account precedent rather than any particular kind of rule of precedent. Whereas I believe one of the points of this paper is to understand as a part of judicial duty there was some obligation to find a clear and stable meaning of the Constitution before deciding not to follow it. So that's how I think I would uh, distinguish this. I, I think I just don't quite agree. I think that uh, with the last point, I do think that they understood judgment uh, as, as something as, 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 as akin uh, to discovering. Of course, that didn't mean you necessarily were absolutely certain of something. But that uh, was not a, a matter of choice. I discuss, actually, which I think is, um, is just very different from the way they thought of it. I, I, I think I emphasize how Thayer, which I think is very much how the modern progressives think about it, he keeps talking about choice, choice, choice. You have all these choices. I think that's not the thought. Of course you have judgment. You have to go to, to uh, have judgment even in the factual world. I mean, one... One, uh, one uh, matter is going to seem to you better, there's better evidence that so-and-so did this than that. There's still judgment involved in that, but it's still external to the judge. It's something that is potentially discovered. I think that is their regime rather than one of choice, uh, which I think is Thayer's regime. So I do see a, a pretty strong dichotomy there. I, I just wanted to say a word about Jim's point about the political nature of constitutional adjudication as opposed to the legal nature. I, I do think that modern originalists do make the claim um, that, it, this, that, that what they're, to the extent they're looking for the original public meaning of the text, they are in search of a, an empirical fact about what the I, meaning I, of the text I, was. My, my point was, if you're dealing with living, living constitution people, and they're the ones who are doing the constitutional review, would John still say that constitutional review is fundamentally a legal enterprise, or would he then say, if we don't have any originalists at all, we're not doing a legal enterprise anymore. Uh, I, I would say that, but it, your paper yeah. doesn't read that way. Uh, I think I would say that. Okay, this, paper is a, this paper, is a, maybe I should, uh, I didn't think I needed to qualify that. I mean, I'm in a world where I think people are essentially all, the, the evidence I give, I think everyone, one of the interesting things about the, the world back then is everyone's an originalist. You know, they, 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 they may not call themselves originalists. They're like these people who who, uh, who speak prose without knowing it, right? So in Canada, it's a political enterprise. It's it's well be. <laughs> I think that's right, okay. Well, it, absolutely, and certainly in France, the Constitutional Court is, I think, explicitly a political enterprise. Okay, uh, our, our second group of three is Mike Rappaport, Michael McConnell, and Earl Maltz. Okay, well, I think this is a, a great paper for a lot of the reasons why Randy said. Um... So, I guess I'm not as, you know, you, you all, as an originalist, you got to go where the evidence leads you, but that doesn't mean you, you have to like it, right? So, um, the question, so I'm not really um, enamored of the idea of judicial restraint or, the, or even uh, the, the clarity idea. And, and so the question really becomes, um, to what extent now is the evidence that John presents in this paper, does that basically, if one believes that that sort of evidence of, of um, let's say, judicial practice significantly informs the judicial power, to what extent that, that pretty much decides matters in, in, in terms of um, some notion of a duty of clarity, if you will, or judicial restraint in the alternative formulation? Um, so, so how much does the history prove here is, I guess, another way of putting the point. And um, I guess what, if you were trying to look at the other side, you know, what could be made on the other side based on the history, one thing that's, that's sort of missing so far are people who get up and say, you know what, there isn't any duty of clarity. It's just you, you got to decide the case, whatever the weight of the evidence is. Um, uh, I guess by the preponderance standard, right? So, so, so that's not there, and that would be very strong evidence if there were a lot of statements of that sort in the other direction. As far as I can tell, there aren't any. So, so does that sort of end the matter? Um, and I suppose the next step would be to, to look and see how many cases there are where people don't invoke the clarity idea. 
right? You know, if there were, if there were, if this was just sort of a, you know, some portion of the of the set, but there were a larger portion of of the set where people didn't invoke it, um, then uh, you know th that might lead you to say, well, you know, only some people were invoking it. There was some disagreement here, um, and then I, I think that sort of pushes us back one step further which is to ask sort of really where this came from and why this statement was made, right? So, so John's view of it um, is that maybe it comes out of the, the materials that, that um, Philip Hamburger is looking at, and, and that's a possibility. Let me just sort of throw out the possibility of an alternative take on it, which is that um, at the time, this is a kind of new power uh, reviewing um, striking down things that are unconstitutional. And judges, you know, had been impeached and pushed out, and it was very difficult for them to assert this power. And so they, they say, oh, well, we would never do it in an unclear case. It's kind of a, um, uh, a political defense mechanism. Right? They're, 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 it's, it's only when there's clear violations. You can't possibly be in favor of, of clear violations. Um, so, so one possibility is that's where it comes from, or some people start stating that in the beginning and then it's followed up on. Um, if that were the case, to what extent would that undermine it? I'm not even sure. Maybe you know, people start saying it and people start repeating it and it becomes part of the understanding of judicial power, or perhaps not. You know, it really depends on how many other people invoke judicial review without applying that. Um, so I'm not really sure where all this leads. I'm just sort of asking, trying to ask a question whether or not there's, based on at least on historical grounds, a way of not getting this kind of judicial clarity idea. And, and maybe there is and maybe there isn't, but I wanted to kind of sketch out some possibilities. Uh, I, I like the paper a lot. Just two uh, quick points in which I'm uneasy about it. Uh, uh, very specific ones. One is on pages eight to nine, you talk about type one and type two errors. Uh, but you don't make the point that seems to me very important here, which is that, uh, is that type two errors are much harder to correct. That is, um, if you allow some state law to go into effect, uh, that has pernicious consequences. Other states will see that it's pernicious. They won't follow it, and it'll get repealed, or at least there's a possibility of, of reform in the democratic system, whereas if you have a Supreme Court decision saying, you know, no, uh, no laws against abortion or whatever, it's just extremely difficult to, uh, uh, to correct it if it is an, an error, and thus it seemed to me that by the logic that you're presenting here at 8 to 9, that there ought to be, that it's really a much more powerful argument for restraint than you give it uh, uh, credit for. Um, and the second point is that you, you argue that, uh, I, you know, of course, and I'm quite persuaded you're right, that, that uh, before any kind of uh, restraint kicks in, the judge should look at every consideration and should really think very hard about what the evidence does show about what the Constitution um, means, but you imply that uh, today uh, we might uh, that there's going to be that that's going to lead to clearer answers than it did once upon a time because we now have so many more resources that can be brought to bear and it's easier to run word searches on on early newspapers and 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 whatnot. So that might be true. It probably is true, but it seems to me that it, that there's a more than countervailing uh, consideration that the problems we are now looking at get to be more and more distant and, and less and less analogous uh, to the to the uh, ones where we are where we do have uh, concrete uh, evidence. And so I'm inclined to think that over time, rather than uh, the every possible consideration um, method uh, reducing uncertainty, my guess is that over time we're going to have more and more uncertainty. Um, I have uh, two unrelated points. Uh, <coughs> first, picks up on the point that Michael just made, which is that there is not there is not only a problem with knowing all of the evidence, there is a problem with deciding which evidence is important. That is, uh, that you don't know, uh, in terms of uh, one right answer, assuming that there is one right answer, I have a uh, 
I'll spare you my riff on, on what, what the run right answer ought to be, but you're going to have to make some judgment, judgment about whose views of what the original meaning was is important, and that, that gets really difficult as you move farther away. And the example that I would give to uh, uh, the contemporary example is about how I talk to my children uh, loudly, uh, is that uh, I tell them if you weren't in the 60s, if you didn't live in the 60s, late 60s, and early 70s, it's impossible to explain the way that it was. And I think that's almost literally true. It becomes even more. And so you don't, the point, is, and part of that is you don't know who the fringe people are. You don't know who the center people are. You don't know who your central original meaning is, whatever. Again, I'll, I'll leave that at that. The other question is this business about the difference between politics and law. It seems to me that uh, ultimately the 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 decision, constitutional adjudication, has to be a political decision in the following respect. That the decision to decide to use originalist method as opposed to something else, or to, be, to defer as opposed to something else, is a quintessentially political decision. It is a decision about what the role of courts should be in the society, which is a uh, political decision. So that might ultimately lead you to adopt a methodology that is more, that is, I guess I would describe it more in Hart's term, uh, not Henry Hart, not HLA Hart's terms of, no, I'm sorry, Wex, sorry, I'm really old now, of neutral principles rather than something else. And I think of neutral principles in terms of what Randy talks up in terms of a legal decision rather than a political decision. But the ultimate decision to adopt some particular legal methodology is itself a political decision. <laughs> okay, uh, it was six actually, I think. Uh, but uh, well, let me first of all um, begin with uh, Mike's uh, uh, questions about, uh, which I see as two one about the um, people, uh, how, how many people there who just didn't talk about restraint. And that's, you certainly could do that. That'd be a useful thing to look at in the paper. My sense is. Uh, Almost every judge on the pre-martial court at some point talked about restraint, even if they didn't talk about it in every decision, which I think is indicative. Another thing I think is indicative is in some of, actually, the one thing I think is most interesting about the state court cases uh, after the Constitution is framed is, at least in one of them, there's a reference to the standard as if, well, everyone knows that's what the standard is. And so those, I think, would be useful ways of pushing back on the idea that this was this is that there are a lot of people out there who are just not doing it even if they don't uh, who, who, who actually don't believe in this I don't see much evidence for that and I see some counters to that evidence your next question I think is a very good one is well strategic could these people be all being strategic uh, in a kind of martial way that they want to establish judicial review in their power and of course one can't and I think you rightly raised the question, well, what can you do about that kind of argument? In some sense, well, that's always the possibility of, of, of uh, originalist uh, uh, evidence could be dismissed because these people are being strategic. And what I try to do in the paper is say, well, at least there are reasons, going back to Philip Hamburger's work, even if it isn't about a judicial uh, uh, review of, um, in our context, of legislation. There's an idea of deference in dealing with government action. There's an understanding of Blackstone, of trying to create harmony of law, that make it at least quite plausible that this isn't strategic. And I think that's really about what you can do, because, of course, at some point, it's hard to dismiss things as strategic, particularly if they're, the practice is as ubiquitous as this seems. Uh, to uh, uh, Mike McConnell's uh, two questions, the uh, one type one and type two errors, well, I think that's an excellent point, which I should take account of, but let me respond uh, about how I think I might take account of them. First, even well, my point there, as I remember, is, well, the Constitution doesn't tell us what's more important in type one and type two errors, and it's not even clear to me, even if uh, it's harder to correct, which well, I should certainly discuss, that it's worse uh, from to allow uh, some constitutional violation to go on. It really depends how you weight that, uh, and I don't think the Constitution tells us about that. 
maybe more importantly, I would say, I think in some ways we've only come to the view that it's very hard to correct these errors because we have this very strong idea of constitutional precedent, something I'm sort of skeptical of in other work uh, when it conflicts with the original meaning of the Constitution. In other words, I tend to think that the premise should be we should look at the Constitution again unless it creates enormous costs or unless we think there's a consensus in society that supports that precedent. So maybe I don't think uh, uh, it's quite as hard to correct or, or as, as, it, as it would be if we were thoroughgoing uh, originalists and took the thoroughgoing normative view of originalists. But I still think that's a powerful point that I need to take account of. The next point is also, I think, one I need to take account of, but let me again push back a little. Uh, at least in my understanding is that the Constitution is a set of principles, and I think the Constitution is then plausibly applied to a variety of facts, even if the framers didn't know anything about them. I don't think it's much harder to apply the principle of freedom of speech to the internet than it was to the printing press. And if that's the case, what's important really is to understand the extent of the principle. And I still think that our um, information is so much better. I mean, it, stri it strikes me, I, I uh, actually, uh, again, going back to Randy's article, I really had struggled with, well, are, is the New Deal, is there something to be said for the New Deal uh, cases? But after reading that, I'm pretty persuaded, well, there's really nothing to be said as an original matter for the New Deal cases. And uh, I think you can uh, amass a kind of evidence that can give you a kind of clarity which just wasn't possible uh, previously. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> let me go to, to uh, Earl's uh, comments about, uh, well, you'd had to experience, the, you couldn't really tell you about the 60s unless you were there, which is sort of like the, well, you couldn't really have the experience of, uh, the framing, unless you were there. That's true, I guess, but on the other hand, it strikes me that that's a very double-edged sword. You have a little bit of the experience. The advantage of big data is you have a perspective that isn't so experiential, and so I think that's yet another advantage, actually, of the remoteness of us in time from the founding. I mean, Marshall knew what, in fact, I think he was influenced, uh, maybe incorrectly, in some of his article uh, three analysis by things he remembered at the uh, at the uh, convention, um, uh, perhaps. Uh, so I, I, I'm not at all sure that that's the case. I mean, the final point is I think I agree with your final point that ultimately you have to make a normative defense of originalism. My point here is just how they thought, not that it's their the best normative defense. I think their th thinking of the argument was the kind of analytic idea you sometimes find still in defenses of originalism, we're just applying the law. That's what we should be doing. I agree that ultimately you need to have a better justification. Mike and I have tried to provide one. Randy's tried to provide one. And I tend to think you have to have those consequential, consequentialist or some other justification. So in that sense, I agree that judicial review is political. But I don't think it's a political concept in the framers' constellation of concepts. It's a legal concept that proceeds from the idea of the duty of the judge. I, I just think one I would, thing I would add is that I think restraint is political, uh, at least the way it's used now. So all the arguments after uh, the NFIB versus Sibelius case were submitted, all, after the case was submitted, all the most of the arguments that then poured forth, beginning with the president to the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee and all the columnists, um, uh, were political. They were all urging the Chief Justice to decide the case using restraint on pol and all the arguments for him doing so were political. They were not legal. Um, in leading up to the case, there was a mix of political and legal arguments, some of which were legally, you could do it this way, but once it looked like the case was going the wrong way from them uh, based on oral argument, then at that point it was pure restraint all the way down and all the arguments for restraint were political. And that was the point I was trying to make earlier. That's an argument to move away from meaning. Uh, it's why restraint is a dangerous uh, concept uh, for those of us who are trying to advocate following the meaning of the text itself because it's basically telling you pay no attention to the text over here because this is what you really should be worried about, and these considerations are political.
Marty, I wasn't sure whether you were trying to invoke our new special dispensation rule or just to get on the queue here. Oh, okay, great. Um, so in that case, uh, we'll now hear three questions from three Larrys, um, from <laughs> Larry Solom, Solon and Alexander. Okay, um, so uh, I just really like this paper. I think it's a really useful paper. Um, I have two very particular suggestions. So um, the first suggestion is I think that there's a slight overclaim about us knowing more than the framers, right? And um, because of big data. And that's this. We, we have a much greater capacity to process huge numbers of, uh, huge quantities of text than they did. That part of your argument I agree with. But um, they did speak the language as their own natural language. And actually, that's a huge amount of data, right, that they acquire through childhood. They can interact with each other. So this does not deny the claim that you do make, but I just think that you want to point out that there's another side sort of to the language, the, the language you cite. Second suggestion is that you might want to consider adopting uh, a distinction that um, Tom Colby makes in uh, The Sacrifice of the New original, Originalism between constraint and restraint, right? So it's a technical distinction. It's not, ne it's, it, 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 it's not necessarily the way everyone uses these words. But the idea is this, that the constraint is what's provided sort of by the text. Right, so that we get constraint when the meaning of the text, and from your perspective, the meaning after we do all the clarifying work is sufficient to decide the case, and then we follow it. Right? Restraint is something a little different. That's when we defer to a decision that's been made by another institution. So um, the two things are not are not the same. In fact, they can contradict each other. Right? You can the if you were constrained, you would decide the case in way X, but because of a doctrine of constraint, you're not going to do so. So I just, I think it's Restra a... Restraint. 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 You're, because constraint <laughs> leads you to decide the case in way X, but restraint says that you should abstain from doing that. So um, I think it's a really helpful distinction, and I think that it clarifies the point that Randy was just making um, uh, uh, and I, I know that adding distinctions has its own set of problems, but I think this one is very useful. So those are my two suggestions. Um, I also very much like this paper, and there's, there's a little section of it on page 13 called Judicial Restraint as an Interpretive Rule, in which you said it's really not the best way to look at it, and, and I agree with that. Um, but there, there's a, there is an interpretive rule that's kind of a, a, a sister of this that I, I think might be of interest here, and that's a rule of statutory interpretation that says that statute should be uh, construed so as to avoid constitutional questions. And um, I, I don't know the history of that canon. So I, I don't know, for example, whether early on it reinforced judicial restraint with respect to interpreting the Constitution, or it was a safety valve to be able to be more aggressive and just not talk about the Constitution, rather talk about the statute. So there, for example, there's, there's a, you know, it's used in Holy Trinity Church without calling it that, but it's also used in a case um, called, a um, 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 hundred years later called um, um, NLRB versus Catholic Bishop of Chicago, where they decided that the um, National Labor Relations Act was not intended to permit um, uh, parochial school teachers to unionize because sooner or later you're going to have some kind of constitutional issue where the work rules say that you don't have to go to some religious event but the church thinks you should go to that religious event. And if you're talking about a restrained um, uh, analysis of whether that statute was going to be considered constitutional or not, it would be pretty aggressive to say, well, it's, it's, it's unconstitutional either on its face or as applied because sometimes somewhere something bad might happen in the future. I don't think courts would do that. So, so, but I don't really know whether early on um, that would have happened. It may well be that they were just a two-faced uh, two coin. 
or it may be that they've always been in tension with each other and there's been some mixed feelings about judicial restraint, but there was just another mechanism for dealing with it. So I guess I, I, if that, the, the only question I would ask of that is, do you know? Before answering that, though, is there a question? <clears throat> yeah, um, well, my, my comments really go back to, to Randy's at the, at the beginning. I, 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 I find this whole area very, very difficult because I'm, you know, I'm a simple person, and so I, I like things simply, you know, put simply. So I, I always think about this. If the Constitution is law, and let's assume, to stipulate for a moment, it's, it's higher law, and, and judges have a duty to apply the law, then questions come up in the following way. If, if there's, a, there's a clear rule in the Constitution and what's unclear, what's, what's litigated, is whether a particular term means A or B, if it's, it's ambiguous, or whether a term which is not ambiguous, nonetheless, it, what its extension is in the, in the world. Um, there, it seems to me, um, judges will assume you know, that there's, there's an answer to that. And they will, of course, you will, of course, consult whatever evidence there is. The fact that the legislature considered this and legislated in light of their consideration is evidence, not necessarily good evidence, but it's evidence to some extent. Prior judicial decisions, precedents, can be evidence, at least the, the reasoning of the judges in the prior decisions and the evidence they relied on. But in the end, if you think the term either does or doesn't extend to a certain point, or you think it means A rather than B, and you think that, that the, the evidence weighs in favor of that, then it seems like it is judicial activism to ignore that evidence and decide otherwise. That that, that would be, I wouldn't, call, I wouldn't call that restraint at all. I would call that some sort of activism because what you're, you're doing is you're ignoring what you consider to be the best evidence of what the law is. On the other hand, if, what you, if you're, as a result of the interpretation, you decide that a particular provision is a standard so that to apply the standard requires resort to sort of first order practical reasoning of some sort, then the judicial, uh, judicial craft is, is not superior, Ronald Dworkin notwithstanding, rest in peace, um, it's not superior to necessarily to legislative consideration or executive consideration of how that standard should apply. And there seems to me that's an area where there are good arguments for deference, all the way from, you know, some the, the, the deference of the rational basis review or whatever to the sort of ultimate deference of political question. And, and so I would, you know, so I, I would think that that's the way you would, that the problem should be set up. And it seems to me that any, any departure, though, from what the judge thinks is the best evidence of the meaning, any departure from that in favor of what the legislature decided, having taken that into account, is, is activism of some sort. It's not, it's not constraint. I just want to say just a couple of things about comments that have been raised, and some, somewhat in defense of, of John's take on this. The, the type 1 versus type 2 errors, I, I'm, again, for judges to be taking that into account and using any, any uh, judgment about which errors are worse to depart from what they think is the best evidence of the meaning of the provision, again, seems like not restraint at all. That seems, that's, it, it, you might as well take into account whether you like the Constitution or not, which surely doesn't seem constrained. Um, with respect to the polit Earl Maltz's comments on the, um, the decision, decision between originalism and non-originalism as a political decision, it seems to me the, the right way to think about this is whether we accept the, con the Constitution as higher law, that ultimately is a, a question of, you know, 
what we accept now, and that's normative at its surely at its core. Um, but it's not. A, but but once we accept the Constitution, then it there's an it there, and it has a meaning. And and so that that seems to it seems to me the emphasis there is in the wrong place, and with respect to the canon of constitutional avoidance. Again, I've never I've never under, it, it seems to me that that essentially what judges are doing there is rewriting statutes, which I don't believe they have the power to do in the Constitution. But that's that seems to me that what the canon of constitutional avoidance is. Well, I'll, uh, Yes, uh, again. Uh, so let me. Um, uh, By the way, I love this format. I get to sit up here. I don't have to say anything. John gets to do all the work. This is great. Uh, well, well, first of all, Larry, I mean, I, I think I certainly should say something about that people have power over natural language. Again, I wonder a little bit. People have their own understanding of words, which shades a bit, their own understanding of concepts, which may be a little. Um, unorthodox uh, at the time, and we can come back and know, and, and it's my, my view, is that uh, our information is really always getting better, and it's not clear to me, at least, and you're absolutely right to put that as a caveat, that at some point that we will have a, a, a better or a better blended understanding than any individual does at that time. This is, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, this is really another, uh, this is sort of interesting, it's a part, another part of my world. I'm very, I'm obsessed, some of my colleagues think, with technological acceleration, and I do think that is even going to have an effect on originalism, but I absolutely agree I should put that in as a, um, uh, as a, as a caveat. Um, Secondly, I, I think that the idea of making a distinction between constraint and restraint is a good one, and I will, uh, will do that. Um, with respect to um, uh, constitutional avoidance, um, I, I didn't find many instances, really any instance of constitutional avoidance. Of course, famously, again, we could wonder how strategic it was, a marshal in Marbury versus Madison had a real opportunity uh, for constitutional avoidance. I'm, I'm just not sure, uh, but you're... How do one think about the time? I specifically say that I'm not saying anything about that, um, but one might think, well, harmonization can go two ways. You can harmonize something by making the statute, and uh, uh, and you might think that's going to have less, um, going to be less problematic actually than uh, than uh, adopting any um, stance of judicial clarity towards the the Constitution. That's maybe why that. Uh, evolved as a statutory rule, but I can't find any good instance of that in the early period. Um, and with Larry, I think I think we may just have a disagreement on how to do originalism, because I think you begin with an idea that, well, the Constitution is law, and then all of this follows from it. My understanding is judicial review is a term, it may go back to my first order point, that there's a, constitu there's a legal space into which uh, the Constitution is put, and that may have different understandings back then that really doesn't accord with our, the way our syllogistic way of understanding the way law operates. And I've offered a few reasons why they might think that this may make sense. You might not think they make any sense, but I think that's the better way of understanding judicial uh, review, because I think the best arguments for judicial review aren't the syllogistic arguments that Marshall made, the textual arguments that Marshall makes in Marbury, but it's the idea that there was an idea of judicial duty uh, that had grown up and that the Constitution sort of hooked on to, and therefore it's certainly possible that there's an understanding of judicial duty that doesn't accept the kind of uh, syllogisms that you're arguing. And I find a lot of evidence for that, although quite, I also find that uh, uh, this idea of judicial clarity isn't as uh, restraining as certainly the progressives make it. So I, I think it, this may be just a basic difference in constitutional methodology rather than a disagreement on anything you said. Okay, we actually still have seven people on the queue and about five minutes to go, so just advising you of that. So, so our next group of three uh, consists of uh, Stephen Sachs, Nathan Chapman, 
and with apologies for my bad eyesight and terrible memory for names, our, our colleague from University of Dallas, I met last year, but I, D David Wright, okay. <laughs> so I'll uh, try to brief, I have just two quick questions. The first is a sort of minor pushback along lines others have stated, which is um, the, the discussion of legal science and the extent to which at the time of the framing people thought there was sort of one right answer, in particular one discoverable right answer, I think is less certain than at least the tone of the paper, if not its content, sort of make clear. Um, certainly there is sort of Madison's discussion of how, you know, any written enactment is going to be largely equivocal until we sort of really hash it out in practice um, in the discussions of liquidation that Caleb Nelson and Jeff Powell have done work on. Um, so I think, I'm not sure that that's intention with, with what you say about that. I think maybe a better way of framing it, perhaps, I don't know, would be something like, it's not there's necessarily one discoverable right answer, but there's one appropriate method to going about that right answer. And that's what judges are doing. And it's not sort of a zone of free play for them to write in. You know, once, once they've eliminated uncertainty, they don't, they don't have a sort of zone left to, to play around in. Um, this, uh, so I, I'm not sure, for instance, that Madison would disagree necessarily with anything that Hart says about vehicles in the park. I think that that might be totally uh, something that they would recognize as, as, as a then contemporary phenomenon. Um, the second thing I did want to push on was to, to echo uh, uh, Mike McConnell's comment about do we actually know more than they did then? And I think that one family of areas where we're not necessarily going to know more would be constitutional implicature. So things where it's not you know, entailed from what they said, but it's just something that somebody who's in the, you know, stuff that's in the water would understand. So if you say, you know, have you eaten? We don't mean have you ever eaten? We mean have you eaten recently? Um, whereas if you say have you eaten Venezuelan blackberries, that's very different. Um, and similarly, there might be lots of things that the dumbest lawyer in 1800 knew like the back of his hand that we take a lot of effort to recover and pick up and to know what to look for in the giant pile of big data that we have. So I'm not sure that that's something that your argument in any way depends on. And so I'm wondering whether it you know, is necessary to make or necessary to make with the same strength. So I'm grateful for the time crunch because McConnell took my first point and Steve just took my second. So I will get on the queue faster next time. Okay. <laughs> well, in that case, uh, David, yeah. Uh, just a couple points. One is a small point. You make uh, twice in the paper the claim that it was thought that legislators were less to be trusted than judges um, from page 8 to 19. That struck me as, as, as counterintuitive. And, I, and I, you didn't provide any evidence except for a reference to Edward White. Um, article. And his evidence there is, it seemed to me, fairly two obscure uh, 1820s pieces. Um, and the reason it seems to be counterintuitive is um, you mentioned the Republican theory of government. Federalist 55, Madison, makes a discussion about how much we, we should trust human nature significantly, and it's particularly with defense of the House of Representatives as a body that will, in fact, not be too corrupt. Um, so, I mean, there's probably other evidence important position, and it's pregnant and persuasive, at least on his face. Um, the second, you, you mentioned that um, legislators at the time, there, there, was a, there was a presumption that, that men were trying to apprehend nature's rules. And um, this is just a question, but insofar as this method of, of judging is to be applied today, to what extent do you drop that presumption? It seems to me when, when you have a substantial evidence of lawmakers saying, we don't do nature anymore, and we don't even do text anymore. We do history, the capital H. If that's what the lawmakers are saying while they're making the law, um, then it seems to me that you have, um, it, this is not a challenge, this is just a, a question whether this is where your theory would go. Whether the judges are, going to, are going to operate very differently vis-a-vis -vis legislators today, legislatures today than in the past. Um, and the last is a point, uh, follow up to, to uh, your discussion with Stephen Smith about um, judging and, and the difference between choice and will and judge judgment. Um, in your paper, this was this kind of sharp distinction was less clear. But in the, in, in the uh, uh, oral conversation there, you were talking you were distinguishing between choice and you know, being bound. And it seemed to me that your use of legal science, uh, science versus choice might be overlooking some other, um, um, I'm sorry to, sorry to get kind of very, uh, intellectual virtues that um, 
you have, uh, I, I always think of Aristotle's list of intellectual virtues, and one of them is art, which is creativity but, and making, but there's science, but there's also prudence. And prudence is going to reach the right, the prudent, the prudent man reaches the right decision every time. There is a, dis a discernible answer, but that answer is not going to be called, it's not, it's not found through science, it's going to be found through some, something else. Uh, and I wonder to what extent the judges you're looking at are not thinking evil science, but are, but are thinking, yeah, there's a right answer, and the, the man with the, the good inclination can know the right answer. It's not something you can predict in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a code or some sort of scientific method, but it's something you can get because you're a good judge. Well, this was obviously a very substantial paper. I'm afraid... Um Right. Well, if you if you have, if you have a, a very quick response to those uh, comments, okay. Well, uh, there are a lot of comments. There are a lot more on the queue, actually. Um, for that matter so too, I so. have a. Well, I don't want to delay things. What do you want me to do? Um, I'll tell you what. We, I, I, my instructions are to keep the train running on time. Is that right? So I, I think we will uh, thank the, the people for their questions and comments, and those who didn't get a chance to do it, <laughs> and John and Randy for their presentations. Thank you.